Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you for joining us for the Evidence Matters session. I'm Ashley Finley. I'm the Vice President for Research and Senior Advisor to the President at AACNU, one of the CLDE lead partners. And I am so thrilled to be joined in this session by Linda Garcia at the Center for Community College uh, Student Engagement. And uh, I will be inviting Linda in in a moment uh, to to share a, a bit with you all. Um, you know, the, the title of the session is Evidence Matters, and perhaps that might be the, the obvious point. I think what excites me about this session and the kinds of conversations that we have about evidence in particularly the civic learning space is considering what kind of evidence matters. Um, the amount of evidence that matters and the way in which we shape that evidence. So I'm really excited to share with you a little bit of the work that AACNU has been doing. Thank you to Yolanda for a wonderful introduction to, to this work. Um, but uh, just wanted to have the opportunity to provide just a little bit of background on, on what we've been working on, specifically a report that we've recently released at AACNU. And uh, all with the caveat that we have a concurrent session that will take a deeper dive into this report uh, just uh, during the concurrent session band. So please think of what I'm about to lay out as a, a little bit of um, a teaser, if you will, but certainly uh, a kind of a high level summary and, and mostly focusing on the approach that we took to developing this research synthesis, uh, all with the expectation that we'll have a little bit more time to take a deep dive in our concurrent session, but want to make sure that that Linda's got some time to to share with you some exciting work coming out of SESI as well. So, um, if we can go to the to the next slide. So I, I wanted to just start with this, and and that is to highlight that AACNU recently revised about a year ago, actually revised our uh, mission statement. And I wanted to just take a very quick opportunity to situate this work within the work of the association, how it's situated against a new mission statement that, as you can see here, prominently forefronts uh, our championing and our dedication to advancing the democratic purposes of higher education, making explicit our commitments to promoting equity, innovation, and excellence in liberal education. And the graphic that you see beside it is is what I think of, this, is, this has not been association approved, this is my own creative attempt to explain what, what I think we do, um, which is putting student success and learning at the center of, of everything. Um, shaping that with curricular change and transformation, ultimately for, so that students can be prepared to flourish in their, in their lives, communities, and careers. And I, I wanted for this conversation to situate all of those together because we don't see those as separated parts. We see them as part of the whole of what makes for successful students and again, shapes our com deep commitments to equity. And in, in some high level way, that absolutely informed the approach that we took with this research synthesis. And I'll, I'll try to make those connections for you as I talk a little bit more about the specifics of, of what we did. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, the background, I apologize if the, the lettering is a little, a little small, but um, the, the origin of the research synthesis that we, that we just released, and you'll see the um, uh, title of, of that report in, in just a moment, really goes back to a crucible moment, which was released in 2012, developed by Karen McTie Musil, and released through AACNU. And one of the companion pieces of that report was a literature review that I put together for the Department of Education as a companion piece to the crucible moment, helping to lay out some foundational bits of what we knew about the evidence around, as you can see here, civic learning and democratic engagements and in post-secondary higher education. And a, a couple of the things are very quickly rose to the surface that I was reminded of some 10 years later, which was that the evidence that I was finding a decade ago was primarily drawn from service learning experiences. So a, that, 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 those, that that kind of civic learning experience really dominates the field and what we know about the evidence. And that the, the findings themselves were, were largely drawn from um, what we might 
casually refer to as small scale studies, but single campus, a single program, single course, single year, uh, all evidence that matters, absolutely. Um, but one in which becomes confined to the, to the parameters of, of that study itself, very hard to extrapolate from those studies to wider populations of students. And the other thing that, that came through that we might have a, time, a little bit of time to return to, but I wanted to, to seed it here is a, is a quote that I pulled. Um, this is actually from that original literature review about a decade ago, but a really wonderful quote by Cress, Christine Cress et al. Um, around just how we define civic engagement. This is way too, too long to read and maybe you've been able to skim it as I've been reading along, but but the, the first part is really the, the most important bit. Campuses have used a variety of terms to describe their civic engagement activities. Some of the most widely used are service learning, community engagement, community-based learning, democratic practice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the language becomes really important here. And that too was an important shaping of how we approach the synthesis. So, so those three pieces all together really provided what we thought was an opportunity a decade later to revisit the evidence that we now have around student civic learning um, on college campuses. The next slide, please. So we posed a what if, and um, with a huge thank you to Lumina Foundation for uh, letting us pursue this what if, but what if we went about the literature as a research synthesis by setting a set of, by setting and establishing a set of parameters, research parameters for ourselves, which even this is just the basics of those parameters. We'll get more into the even more of the details in the concurrent session. But broadly speaking, parameters that were focused on studies with the greatest probability of extending beyond the boundaries of a single context of the study. Um, one would say generalizability, external validity. These are the kinds of, of things that we were looking for. We'll talk about how we did that. Um, what if we also broadened the way in which we conceived of community engaged activities? So yes, we would absolutely incur, incur, uh, look at service learning studies, but we would intentionally go beyond that to look at internships, field work, community-based research, global learning experiences, all important contributions to the umbrella in which we might conceive of civic and community engaged work. And then what if we also very intentionally went after um, a set of outcomes, mindsets, aptitudes, and dispositions. And with credit to my colleagues at AAC and U that, that worked with me on this, uh, Jessica Chittam and Catherine Ank at AAC and U, we formed the research team that with these parameters set out to figure out, see what we would find a decade later. And the next slide will show you just a little bit of what that was. So in the amount in depending on what you know about the studies and the amount of studies that are out there, given a set of parameters, so looking across multi-institution, multi-year, large sample sizes, multi-cohort, really, again, focusing on those studies with the highest potential to be able to expand, expand on the, um, the findings beyond the confines of a single study to broad populations of students, we found 53 that fit those parameters. Now, I would say in the, in the one sense, that is not maybe as many as we'd hoped to find, but it's certainly more than five. <laughs> so we, we did feel like we both might yearn for more evidence to be out there after this much time, as we've been talking about civic learning. But on the other hand, we have a pretty solid evidence base around notions of generalizability of data and findings. So that was um, reassuring, validating in, in certain ways. But some, some um, consistent things came through. Some, some residual effects from 10 years ago still came through. Uh, I did want to highlight, we'll talk a little bit more about the kinds of outcomes that we looked at, but we looked across six outcome categories. So we really intended this to be quite a robust looking across the effects of what civic learning can do. But these, are, these, next, these next two bubbles are really the lingering effects of what happened a decade ago. Still a preponderance, a heavy preponderance of evidence surrounding service learning. So finding, so expanding again the notion of what other kinds of activities affect the way that we conceive of community engagement and civic learning on campuses and still broadly sort of bound to service learning activities. And still a, I think what we'd all roundly call a dearth of evidence 
uh, specifically interrogating the effects and beneficial uh, results for underserved students and, and their success with these, uh, with these experiences. So with that, I'm going to welcome and turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Linda Garcia at SESI to tell you a little bit more about their, work, their research and work. Thanks, Ashley. It was great to, to listen what uh, the organization has been doing on this work and happy to compliment what you said. So we're going to go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about SESI. Uh, let me just tell you, SESI stands for the Center for Community College Student Engagement. We're housed at the University of Texas at Austin, the College of Education. And with SESI, we absolutely love to hear the student voice. When you think of the student voice, think of SESI. We provide data, share data with community college leaders so they can make informed decisions to make sure what they're doing, their practices that are in place are working for students. So it's very critical to understand the student experience and make sure that we are addressing their needs, making sure that we get them to the finish line. So with our data, we do qualitative and quantitative data. Our, through our data, we love to provide aha moments. We don't say we're in the business of surveys, but we are in the business of conversation starters with community colleges. Just to give you a couple of background numbers of SESI, we've worked with nearly the thousand community colleges in the nation, and these are our two surveys uh, that we administer. You'll see the one on the far left, Community College Service Engagement, which is also SESI, which is also our name, but we're triple C, this one's double C. It's really looking at the experiences of continuing students in the spring term. We say those who have persisted. But if you're interested to know about, what about those entering students? Let's say those who start in the fall. Sense is the one that's on your far right, the survey of entering student engagement. So those are two surveys that we administer. And I'm gonna pull a data point uh, to share with you about uh, service learning on what students have to say about that. You can always go to our website, cccse.org to learn more about these uh, surveys. Accessing. We absolutely believe that student engagement does not happen by accident, but it has to be intentional. It just cannot be organic. Think about the places that you go. Think about if you went to Walt Disney World or if you go to New York City, things are so intentional to get you engaged. So we talk about Ceci, what if we dug in deeper and we were more intentional about the student experience, making sure that things were not uh, optional, that things were absolutely created where students must experience something for them to get to the finish line, all for the betterment of student success. So student engagement has to be intentional. So I wanna talk about high impact practices with SESI, with our work. Now we know high impact practices, it's just an active learning practice and experience. It promotes uh, deeper learning. And we know that high impact practices it shows a rate of increased student uh, retention, um, student engagement, and persistence and graduation. Now, there are many examples of high impact practices in higher education. As you heard Ashley say, it could be internships. There's also learning communities, tutoring, and supplemental instruction, orientation. There's just so much more. But in our time together that we have, the high impact practice that I want to highlight to you is service learning. So why is that? Why is service learning so important? So here are a couple of reasons I just wanna share with you. And I'm sure you're already, you're thinking of this. Service learning, it connects the student learning experience from the classroom with their, real, with their learning to the real world. It allows them to learn about how to serve others, to expand their capacity to serving others. It also uh, helps them to better understand the meaning of responsible citizenship. It challenges students to develop new ways of thinking and responding just to new people, to situations. And it also gives them an opportunity to self-reflect and, and just allow them to become more self-aware of themselves and when they're placed in situations. And we know that service learning, um, when we look at the research, it shows that when students participate in activities such as this, they are more deeply engaged in their community. They gain uh, skills, more understanding of it. Uh, they, it helps them develop career goals. And again, they're just more engaged as a citizen, high impact practice. So let me show you 
um, a data point that we asked students. Now, I took this from our SESI survey, which is uh, recently administered this past spring. But we look at a three-year cohort because colleges administer every two to three years. So in this population that, I, that I'm going to share with you, it, it's about 200,000 students nationwide. Um, and we asked students this one question. Have you participated in a community-based project such as service learning as part of a regular course during the academic year? There are response options to this survey item. For you today, I wanted to highlight the students who said never. And I want you to think about the percentage of students who never had this experience. But I want you to think about part-time students, and I want you to think about full-time students at the community college. So I'm going to give you two seconds to think about those percentages. Okay, do you have that? Did you write it down? Did you share that with your colleague who's maybe sitting next to you? Okay, are you ready? Here's the percentage of students who never participated in a community-based project such as service learning. Part-time students, 82%. Full-time students, 73%. Now, did that surprise you? Now, when we talk about high-impact practices, we know this really impacts student success. It helps students get to the finish line. These are so many, one of many components that get students to the finish line. But think about going back to what Ashley said, what if, what if we decided to make service learning inescapable? What if we incorporated it into the course? What if we supported more faculty to have more support to structure, incorporate service learning? We also asked an item that I don't have on the slide and we asked about internships field experience, and we looked at all students, um, it was over 80% of those students who said they've never participated. So again, what if we connected them more to the real world with what they were learning in the course? So my friends, I want to direct you to this URL link. I recommend that you open a second window and go to this URL, and it's sesi.org backslash E-S-A-L. Again, that's sesi.org backslash E-S-A-L. When you type that, you're going to see on your screen that looks something like this. You'll see video clips and narrative search, and you'll see ensure students are learning. So let me just play, um, do a little plug-in on how this was created. So SESI, with a lot of partners in higher education, have been working on this national conversation of Guided Pathways. Guided Pathways has four pillars. One of the pillars that we focused on um, at the, for this uh, project was pillar number four. And pillar number four is ensure students are learning. And Guided Pathways is really about making sure that students, they have an academic plan, that they have um, supports put in place to get them to the finish line, that they, whether it's graduation, whether it's transferring, whether it's getting to the workforce, but making sure that they have a livable wage. And so these pillars support uh, that guided pathways framework. So going back to pillar number four, when you click on this URL, you see the screen, but I wanna direct you to something that will be useful in your conversations, because again, SESI is about conversation starters and hoping that you, the colleges dig in deeper, the leaders dig in deeper, and they have conversations to understand the student experience. On the uh, right side, you're going to see this horizontal toolbar. Go ahead and click on video clips and narratives. All right, so when you click on that, you're going to go to a screen when you scroll down and it looks something like this. When you scroll down on that screen, there is a drop down box and it says components of pillar number four. When you click that, you're going to see all these options that support the definition of pillar four, ensure students are learning. One of those options is a high impact practice. You're going to see that and you see that gray highlighted. It's service learning. If you are a faculty or you're a community college leader and you're wondering, how can I incorporate service learning? into the experience of my students, here are some examples that we heard from faculty. So when you click on that, you're going to see some examples. You're going to see a vignette, perhaps, 
or maybe you'll see uh, some slide, um, videos there that you can share with your colleagues. So for instance, if you click on this vid, um, link right here, uh, it's a vignette. And it's a faculty person sharing how he or she has share, um, incorporated service learning. And you'll see this, it was a nutrition course. Uh, students engaged in this by volunteering in a soup kitchen. The instructor builds partnerships with local establishments and allows students to set up day and time volunteer. But if you look at the second paragraph, it says that these students, uh, they choose the menu item on the, kitchens, the soup kitchen's website. They analyze the nutritional value. They make changes based on their concepts that they learn during class. Um, and you'll see many more activities. That's just an example of what's offered on that searchable database. But I want to direct you back to that sessi.org backslash ESAL. When you hit that back button, there's also another area that I would like to highlight. And you'll see that red box there. And there's description. So if you're wondering, how does this project define service learning as an example? You click on that, you scroll down, and there are many definitions of those high impact practices, but there's one of service learning. So you'll see this here, uh, the definition in the, the lens that we look at. In addition to that, when you go back and hit the back button, there's also participating colleges, because you may be wondering, okay, where did SESI get all these narratives? Now I said from faculty, but what faculty? So when you click on that, you're gonna see the list of co community colleges that are represented in all of these vignettes and videos in the searchable database. What we did is we interviewed over 200 faculty members who received the NYSOD Excellence Award. The NYSOD is a national organization on professional development and community college leaders nominate their um, faculty who they believe must be recognized for the effort that they're doing at their college. So we were fortunate to interview those folks. So that's where the stories, the narratives, the videos come from. I also wanna share just one more thing before I bring Ashley back on, if there's time, is a video of what faculty and a president have to say about service learning. So take a listen to what these folks have to say. The service learning is really my favorite part, uh, my favorite high impact practice in the classroom. I have students um, work in groups. They get to choose the agency or organization that they volunteer with and that they perform their service hours. And it's a, it's a fairly um, involved process, but as it, at the end of the day, they do their service they come back to the class and they do an oral presentation based on their experience and they write a reflection paper. The reflection papers are my favorite part because they get to say how that experience changed them in some way. And that's what I want to know, like, did you change the way you think or feel or how you see the world? And that's what I want to happen. And it, it happens. And students say some of the most wonderful things. Um, I didn't realize that homeless people are just like me. I could be homeless too. Or I didn't realize that veterans are so lonely. It makes me want to go visit my grandparents. Um, I didn't know that uh, people who live in poverty had such obstacles to overcome. And I learned some ways that I can reach out and, and, and work and help and make this world a little bit better place. And when I read those reflections, it's like, that's learning. They learned about themselves. They learned about others. They learned about the world around them. And in my opinion, that's really what college is all about. Um, some of the civic um, engagement um, that students participate in um, at our institution are working at um, soup kitchens, helping at homeless shelters, um, also working with our metro parks, um, through our libraries. Um, they will go out, do some service, and then they bring it back and tie it back into the classroom and say, what do I do now after I've learned this? What do I do? What does that mean? And so they learn how to apply that civic mindedness into their daily lives. We provide a lot of services out into our community. Um, Last year, we had 57,000 hours of authentic service learning 
and what we call authentic service learning is projects or service learning that is built right within the curriculum. So they're not just the extra project that a club did or, you know, we had a canned food drive or whatever. These are built right. Well, we had a little technical difficulty right there. But anyways, we will share this video uh, and make it available to you. Also, you can go to our YouTube channel, Ses just type in Ceci in YouTube uh, on YouTube there in the search bar, and you can find many more videos. Thank you so much, Linda. I, I always learn something from you and Ceci's rich, amazing work. I thank you so much for bringing back in how important it is to get the qualitative data as it is the quantitative data. Um, we, we badly need all of it to, to tell this story. Uh, and we also knew that we would not have enough time for this session, and now we're out of time. But uh, I just want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here. And I know we have a, just a very short break, and then please come back for the mobilizing policy leadership to make college civic learning. Thank you for putting that up. A shared priority, some serious star power in this session. I'm excited to listen to it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Looking forward to seeing you soon.